Thank you, everybody. Let me uh, start the presentation here. I want to thank the organizers for uh, for making this possible and for everyone joining. I hope we are uh, successful in uh, in the the in the first technical trial of, of getting this all to work. Um, so, as uh, as, the, uh, as as Jay said, uh, I'm a, a re I'm a lead researcher for this group, Google Accelerated Science, and we spend a lot of time working with all kinds of natural scientists. Uh, to see what kind of things we can do together, uh, and and that would be difficult to do if we didn't uh, if we didn't work together. And so um, we've done a whole lot of different projects over the five or so years that we've that we've been around. And if you're interested in the types of things we've done, you know, please check uh, please check out our website where you can see references to everything I'm going to talk about today, as well as a whole bunch of other fun stuff. So my goal today is I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, 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 particular examples of how we've used machine learning to really uh, perceive the world um, and allow us to, to see things or hear things that we that would otherwise be difficult to do it, especially at the scales that we want to do them. And so the first example I want to talk about, um, we've typically called seeing more. And the context for this is um, uh, this technique that showed up uh, from the machine learning world a few years back to do what's commonly called image to image regression. And one of the, the classic examples of this are to take a natural uh, scene picture like you see over here on the left, and then, you, and then to get the true depth of that. So we know the walls are further back, the desk is closer. And then we try to get, uh, the, we try to build a machine learning model that is able to predict that depth image from this input image. And as you can see over here on the right, these machine learning models can do a decent job. This is because they learn something about the natural world and the types of things that are typically seen, that they're, they're in the same way that you and I can infer the depth of the scene, these models can. Now, if you're wondering why you know, people actually wanna do this, well, the thing that you have probably seen are actually the applications of this on portrait data. So here, if you're taking, you know, if you're taking the selfies, we, the, these algorithms will figure out what part of the selfie is the foreground, and that allows you to do all these great effects like desaturate the background or defocus and make all of your selfies look better. Now, well, that's a, a, a noble thing to do. Uh, we, were, we, we said, well, these are, these are really interesting techniques. Let's see where else we can apply them. And so the, the task we're looking at um, is looking at um, uh, images of cells growing in dishes. So if you're not familiar with this kind of thing, it's very common in biological research to grow up cells in, in, in little tiny wells. And most often, uh, biologists will look at images like you see, over, you see over here on the right, where you have all these sort of brightly colored. And the way this is done is by putting in these fluorescent stains that bind to particular proteins in these cells. And these are, these are you know, it, it highlight the things you want to see and are, re are relatively easy to, am to, to analyze. But the image over here on the left, this is actually the type of, a type of image just using, um, just using light um, that is actually much easier to take. It requires less perturbing of the cells. You can do it while they're alive very, very easily. And as you can see in this image, there really do seem to be you know, relationships between this bright field image and this, kind of, and this fluorescent imagery. And so this looks exactly like this image to image regression problem we were just talking about, which is, can we use this simpler grayscale, you know, sort of light field imagery over here on the left to predict this image over here on the right? And so I'm not going to give you all the gory details of how, of, of how it's done, but let me show you what it actually looks like. So this is a close up of some, a very similar image to what you were just seeing. And you can see these kind of, you know, these little bumps that, that look like cells and these, and these things that, um, uh, that, that are the, the processes of these neurons. So these are, these are neurons uh, from, from rats. So the, here is the, the light field image. This is the image that the model was trying to predict. This is the truth if you had fixed and stained these things. And then this is the image that um, the model predicted. Now, if you had trouble noticing that I switched the slide, that's my whole point. It's actually very hard to tell from the true image over to the predicted image. Now, as I flip back and forth a little bit, you're probably gonna notice it's not perfect. You know, if you look over here on the right-hand side, the stains here are the blue are, are indicating the nuclei of the cells, and the green is a, is a particular protein marker of death. And there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an image over here on the right that is uh, predicted to be dead, but is actually not. So it's, we, you know, the model thinks it's a dead cell, but it's not. But you can see, by and large, it gets most of this correct. So let me give you another interesting example. So this is also looking at neurons, but these are human neurons. And I wanna uh, draw your attention to this little funny looking feature here in the middle. 
this is completely an imaging artifact. This is not reflecting the actual biology of the actual cells under there. But, but just like the image before, you know, th this is the true and this is the predicted. And the model learns to deal with that imaging artifact without any special um, handling, without having to be told, oh, that's an artifact. Just because it's being told, please, you know, from this image, predict this image, it's able to learn to ignore these kinds of things. And this is a really powerful part of this technique that you do not have to go in and sort of deal very explicitly with all of these special cases. And so um, this has been, uh, you know, we developed this a few years ago, and this kind of thing we're now starting to see uh, used across a number of places in cell biology to allow you to uh, see these kinds of images um, by just taking these much simpler to look, uh, to, to take light field images. So let me give you, let me give you another example. Um, and this one's gonna, 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 now we're gonna pop up to a much larger example about, uh, about what we can see in the eyes. And so uh, the context for this is a disease called diabetic retinopathy. This is the fastest growing cause of pre preventable blindness. It's a uh, complication of diabetes. Something like a third of people with diabetes will develop this and something like a third of those people that develop it, um, it can be vision threatening. And because diabetes is on the rise worldwide, this is really a, uh, this is why it's such a it's such a growing problem. Now the good news is that diabetic retinopathy is relatively easy to detect. So these this is imagery called fundus imagery. Many of you have actually probably had images like this taken when you've gone to the eye doctor. And this is you know essentially taken by shining light in the eye and, and snapping a picture. And what, uh, what doctors can do by looking at this and by looking at some of the fine features of this image, they can they grade these images from a scale of no diabetic retinopathy to the most severe that really needs to be treated. And I'm sure you know, you know, all of you looking at this don't really know what they're looking for, but you know, if we go through it, you, can, you, know, you would be able to learn the types of things that, that, that um, we're looking for. Now, the challenge is, of course, that there's an enormous number of people that need this screening. This is an example from a clinic in India where one of our team members were, um, but it, it sort of and it's sort of indicative of this problem of there's just not enough trained doctors in the world to do the screening that needs to be done for this disease. And so we did what now seems like the very natural thing, which is to build a deep learning model to, to go from this fundus image over to these grades that the doctor um, that the doctors would give, as well as a few other uh, side predictions. And if you know much about the, the deep learning field, this is not, this, this, the, the image model used is not particularly surprising. This is kind of a, you know, a standard well-known uh, way to build these kinds of models. I think part of the real uh, magic of making this thing work is we spend a lot of time getting very high quality data. We hired a whole bunch of ophthalmologists to review images multiple times. We got lots of data and like many things, you know, it's not the, just the quality of the model that you use, the quality of the data matters tremendously. And that's really why we're able to build a model which um, is better than the median ophthalmologist. So over here on the right-hand side, these are um, um, rock curves, which you may be familiar with, but basically if the curve went straight up to 100 and then over like closer to that upper left is better. And the algorithm shown in the dark line here um, it's better than the, than the median ophthalmologist that you see all of these, the, the various ophthalmologists you see here with these colored dots. So this has been a great story and a number of other applications like this are coming out. But there's something about this which I think is really interesting, which we haven't talked about as, as much. And this comes down to sort of a, a side project that somebody did. We had um, somebody joining the team and we wanted to give them a task to get started to learn how to build these models. And we had self-reported gender along with all, all of these um, images, we said, look, here's a great first task for you. you know, tr try to build a model that'll, that will predict gender. We really didn't think that this was, this was gonna work. It was just sort of a chance for someone to get familiar with the underlying, uh, underlying tools and infrastructure. But to all of our surprise, they actually were able to build a very good model that predicted self-reported gender from this fundus image. And the 0.97 AUC here, this is a standard measure of classifier performance. And you know, just trust me in saying this is an extremely good classifier. And so what's really interesting to, about this to me is that this is a case where there was no known way to predict gender from the fundus. 
And so this is a chance for, you know, this really illustrates something that I think is exciting, not just to be able to systematize and do the things that uh, people can already get out of images, but to go and actually see something new. And one of the, and of course, the natural challenge then is how do we from this, um, you know, understand what's going on, what is being seen, and, and see if we can map that back to something human, human interpretable. And that really is an ongoing challenge with this. But once we had success with this, we tried to do all kinds of other things. This is showing trying to predict um, the uh, the age reported by patients, and you can see we end up with kind of you know a pretty decent classifier. It's you know maybe you know plus or minus five years, and you know, a little bit of a skew over uh, skew over here. And so we used, you know this is you know this is also the type of thing where you you kind of know there's probably some differences. Our you know our skin and the vasculature all changes over time as we get older. But now we can actually map that to a real concrete. Uh, prediction here. We've also done for things like uh, blood pressure, where we didn't get uh, quite so good a model, but these are type things that you can sort of see might be causally related to, you know, what the vasculature looks like, but we don't have an a priori model about how to do it. And this is a direction for how we use machine learning in the context of both science and medicine in order to do, really do something that we weren't able to do before. And I think this, this kind of thing is a great illustration of this very exciting direction. So I want to now jump in, you know, you know, keep moving along here and jump into another topic. So here we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, how sort of how we think about doing these kinds of, uh, doing these kinds of uh, machine learning experiments for science. And the context here is in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, it essentially um, affects motor neurons in the way that they develop, leading to a, a loss of voluntary uh, movement uh, for people. And this, can, uh, and this is a genetic disease. Um, and there's several different variants of this disease based on exact, the exact kind of genetic uh, perturbation that you have. And here, what's known is that this SMN gene is also something that's in fibroblasts, which are, which are just skin cells. And so the question is, is there something we can learn about the disease by looking not at motor neurons, which are very hard to get, but looking at skin cells, which are very easy to get. And so the, what we did here was um, with a, a group at Harvard, um, we went through this process where they got skin cells from patients by sort of taking a punch out of the skin, those cells are frozen and then uh, uh, grown up in dish, uh, grown up in dishes. They're um, then uh, fixed so that we can image them well. We go through that staining process I was talking about early on, and you can get and you, with more and with multiple stains, you can highlight different things that you'd like you're seeing over over here. And now the question is, what can we see in these images? And the most natural first thing to say is, well, let's just make sure that we can tell the difference between these SMA patients and, and, and healthy patients. That's the kind of first thing you would want to do. But, the, you know, despite that being the real goal, that's not really the, the, the first thing you can do. You have a big data set like this. And here I'm sort of giving some of the numbers for how big this thing is. And it's not that many patients. You know, we only have 27 uh, distinct patients. But when you start saying, well, I've got these I got to take all these images per well. There's 60 wells per plate, 12 plates per batch. I do two separate batches. That means I sort of two different times. I I process uh, I process the um, the the cells. Um, this is, gets to be quite a bit of data. And so we're going to start off just saying, okay, can we separate the healthy and diseased uh, patients here? And the first thing we ran into is that many of the images are blurry. And you can sort of see some of the images over here, and you can tell the difference between sort of this image down here in the lower right versus this one up here um, in the upper left. You can see we sort of lo really lose a lot of detail. But because we're gathering so many images, we really have to correct for this during acquisition, and we really have to have some way to detect that this is going on. And so the thing we did was to actually build a model to rate the quality of the images, the focus quality of the images we were getting. And I won't go into the, all the details about how this was done, but I think the really interesting part about this was is that we trained this on artificially blurred images. So we took in-focus images like this, we computationally defocused it, and then we and that allowed us to very, you know, have a very very clear task to build a model on to uh, where we knew there was the only thing different between these images was the focus. And so we used that to build a model to predict what the focus quality was. And once we did that, we saw a lot of the very sad things. And so what you're seeing over here is the, the, the big rectangles here 
our, um, in our basically the plates with all those little wells in it where we're growing up the cells. And the color here represents the focus quality where the yellow color here is better and the, um, and the dark, you know, sort of the dark red or black color represents a, a poor focus. And you can immediately see, first of all, there's quite a bit of variation across these different plates. And consistently we get these, you know, the edges are, are quite a bit worse. And what's important here is you really have to notice this in order, you know, you have to take the time to look for these kinds of problems. So what did we do here? Well, at the end of the day, we just had to do a better job taking our images. So we, we got better plates that were just flatter, so we didn't, have this, um, we didn't have the same kinds of problems there. And we also did essentially the, this confocal imaging that allowed us to um, uh, take images at many depths so that we can actually, um, uh, uh, you know, even if the plate isn't completely flat, we can still have one of those planes that's really in focus with the cells. And so with that, you can now see that the, the images we got have a much better focus score and we're able to move on. But when we actually then said, great, let's actually look at models before we even try to predict, you know, which are, which, which are healthy and which are diseased, we looked at, you know, looked at one of these main big problems that comes up, especially in biological experiments of batch effects. And what I mean here is that we sort of processed a bunch of plates at two different times. Um, and, and, you know, those are, you know, that's batch zero and batch one. And I'm not going to go into the details of the model here, but it basically, you know, the, these points in space are kind of a low dimensional projection of what the model is seeing. And you can see what immediately falls out of this is that, you know, batch zero here in blue is just not like batch one. And this, you know, this unfortunately is just the reality of a lot of um, experiments that are done. And it really means you have to think very, very carefully about the way you design your experiment if you're gonna have these kinds of problems. But going further, we said, well, maybe it's not just batch. What about a, a bunch of other of these confounding effects? Like, can we predict which plate it's on? Can we predict which row the image came from? What column the image came from? And what we see is that we have some predictive power. The fact that the embeddings value over here is higher than this permuted basically is representing that we have some predictive power to say that this, uh, that our model is able to tell there's something about it that is different per plate. There's something about it where we're different per row. And this should immediately, you know, you know, worry you a little bit about when I'm, you know, when I'm then looking at, a, at an effect, am I seeing something real or am I seeing, or am I seeing something that's from one of these confounding effects? So there's a lot of questions there, but then when we actually look at this task of predicting uh, healthy versus sick. These are again showing rock AUC values where one is really good. And we sort of did this many, many times by separating out all the different pairs of healthy versus uh, sick, healthy versus sick, healthy versus sick. And what you can see is that the model is not bad on most of the folds, except on this fold over here, it turns out that the model is exactly wrong. It's not just random, it actually predicts exactly the opposite. And here, you know, what, what we, what, when we dug in this a little bit more, we found out that the source of the cells was very well correlated with the, what the model was. These two sources, A and B, the two places that the, that the cells came from. And you can see almost all the healthy cells and one of the disease cells came from one source. And so it looks, you know, we have this unfortunate confounder that we've never been able to resolve of, is the model just seeing something about the source of the, of the lab? And I think this is a really important, um, you know, philosophical idea that as we go to building models where we don't have the exact understanding of what's going on, the models are seeing things that we don't have a direct understanding of, you have to do these kinds of very, very careful uh, test and analysis to try to figure out whether the model is picking up on something that you really don't want it to be picking up on. And so I'm actually, you know, this, I think this, this work really represents uh, a set of things that you have to do to really do these things well and to do the kind of good science with machine learning um, that, uh, that needs to be done. Okay, so I'm gonna go, um, uh, I'm gonna skip, that's what I just said, I'm gonna skip to this next part, and I'm gonna talk about uh, a couple more projects here. In this one, we're now gonna stay, we're gonna stay in the kind of medical area, but we're gonna talk about parasites. And in particular, we're gonna talk about malaria. And so malaria is, is, you know, is a, still a huge disease in the world. There's something around half a million deaths per year. 
Um, and the graph over here on the left is the deaths per year. And you can see it's, you know, fortunately been going down quite a bit over time. And this is, you know, due through a lot of, uh, a, a lot of efforts out there. And, you know, some of them is uh, like bed nets, other ones about good, uh, good uh, molecule, drug molecules that are coming out. But the scary thing about it is, is that um, resistance to our main uh, drugs are really starting to develop. And this, and the graph over here on the right, you know, it shows you how prevalent resistant parasites are to the drugs that we currently use. And so this is, you know, we have a sort of lurking problem here about uh, uh, that the drugs we are using are, are not going to be able to keep this positive trend going. And so what we, one of the things we need here is we need better assays. The current assays that people use are essentially a kind of a live dead screen. You know, you, you have the parasites you, uh, in, in red blood cells typically, you put molecules on them and you find out which ones kill the parasites. But what's really important is you actually need not just you know, you know, hit these hit molecules to start with, but you want them to be diverse and you want them to be diverse in the way that they work. And this is typically called mechanism of action. And so what we're looking for are how do we um, get hits with different mechanism of action? And you can't just see this in a live dead screen. And so the, the driving question for this research is, can we use these kind of high content screens with machine learning to allow us to find diverse hits and not just you know, identify the, on this live dead signal? And so this is a collaboration with our group in the bomb lab at Imperial College. And very much like the other um, examples I've showed you with cells, you know, there are cultures of these uh, red, of red blood cells with the parasites, they're put onto plates and they're imaged. And here I'm showing this kind of false color overlay of these different channels, highlighting different parts of it. And we, and from images like this, we are trying to uh, uh, learn something about the way the uh, parasite, is, the way the drug is affecting the parasite. And so one interesting problem that comes up, also comes up a lot in these kinds of areas is, you know, most of the, Im most of the image is not very interesting. And what you actually have to do here is to find the parts of the image where there actually is a parasite, because all of this stuff up here in the, over in the upper left, there's no parasite in these red blood cells. And so, you know, this is one of these kind of uh, uh, annoying tasks that has to be done early on to really focus on the things you want, that you want to do. But if you don't do this well, your whole, you know, you're in trouble very, very quickly. And so what's important here about how we're going to detect these different mechanisms of action is the parasites go through a whole life cycle um, while they're in the blood. And so it's, there's something like 40, uh, 48 hours and they go through these, these sort of names, these name cycles like a merozoite, uh, like the trope stage and schizont and the merozoite stage. And so, you know, these are kind of bin labels. These aren't really, you know, a completely distinct um, uh, stage of life. Just like saying, you know, a child and a tween and a teen, there's not really a, you know, a clean distinction between those. So this really is kind of a, a continuous life cycle that, that we go through. And so what we did to try to you know, make sure that we could see more from these, from these parasites was to build an ML model to try to predict what stage of life they were in. And the basic idea here is to take all of these images, uh, go through another one of these deep learning classifier, and we just we take one that was trained on consumer images, and we sort of take that uh, top layer out. We, and this is usually uh, called extracting and embedding from these. So it's a way to map this image down to something that's like you know 100 odd dimensions. And so we take all these different stains, we take all each, the embedding for each of those stains, we concatenate them, them together, and then we use that as a kind of lower dimensional representation than all of these pixels up here. And so when we do this, and we, then we ask uh, humans to look at these images and say, you know, is this a trope or a schizont, et cetera, what we see is kind of what you would expect, which is, you know, when, as the, um, I'm showing the kind of life cycle in a circle over here, the colors represent the, uh, the, the human labels for, the, um, for those images. And you can see as we sort of transition from one part of the life cycle to another, the human bin labels start to show some ambiguity. And that's really because there is some ambiguity, right? When a teenager becomes an adult is, you know, certainly somewhat of a, of a su subjective question, especially if all you had to do was to, to have a picture of them, it would be, you know, difficult to tell and there would be some disagreement. And that's the same thing we see here. And so, but from this, we can sort of get something which ends up being this continuous measure of life cycle. And so 
from those human labels, we train a model, and the model is then able to map each of these images onto this life cycle. And so we see the whole, you know, again, the colors here represent different stages of the life cycle, and now we can map each parasite onto the stage of the life cycle. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, remember, we're trying to find um, uh, drugs that operate differently. And one way to look at this is to say, well, does it affect the parasite at different stages of the life cycle? Does it affect the life cycle in some way? And so what you're seeing here is one of the examples of the results. And so the, the, this is a, just a big histogram where the x-axis here is the life cycle. The gray is a control. Basically, there's no drug there. It's just the, um, it's just the solvent that's used. And um, you can see there's a big uh, spike during the, at this ring stage. And now you can see the um, uh, atovaquone proquinol, which is the standard drug that, that's used here, that tends to sort of shift the distribution a little bit to the right, and there's fewer parasites. But that's very different than this uh, perspective molecule called KEA609, which seems to really uh, keep the, the parasite from going into this uh, schizont uh, stage and has a very and has a much different effect than, than this other drug. And this is exactly the kind of thing we're trying to find where we see these, these sorts of differences. Um, so lastly, um, I wanna tell you about one other story. So I, I, I told you at the beginning, this is gonna be about seeing and hearing more, but so far it's all been about seeing. So let me tell you about the hearing part. So here, um, uh, the context here is a disease called ALS, um, sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease. And I'm sure everybody has heard of this, even if they don't remember it, because you may remember the ice bucket challenge that came out a while ago. It sort of got lost in the mix in the, in, in, as this got so popular, but this started as a way to raise money for ALS research. And perhaps the most famous ALS patient is uh, Stephen Hawking. It also illustrates the, you know, the, 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 this disease where it's a law, it's a death of the neurons that control voluntary movement, and that, and that ends up affecting both speech and movement. And so we've partnered with the ALS um, uh, TDI, uh, the ALS Therapy Development Institute, um, who's been working with patients and really supporting research into this disease and really doing uh, quite an amazing job for this. And so one of the things that they've been doing is to uh, gather voice and accelerometer data from people with ALS. So I'm not gonna talk about the accelerometer part today, I'm really gonna, gonna focus on the voice. And here, you know, the, the patients will say particular sentences like, I owe you a yo-yo today. Um, and they've gathered, the, and these, they've gathered these recordings, which I'm representing as a waveform today. And based on those recordings, um, uh, a therapist is able to listen to that and assign this thing called an FRS score. And the FRS score sort of represents um, how, um, uh, how understandable, how functional the person is in general. And so an expert might listen to something like this and assign a particular FRS score, say, okay, we'll, we'll assign that one a two, and you have a different waveform, and they'll assign that, and they'll assign that one a, a different score. Um, and so um, uh, the, the, the challenge is, you know, there are, some of these things are fairly subtle. How do we go from these waveforms in order to detect these subtle changes to map it back to these FRS scores so that we can really understand something about how these patients are doing. And so the main idea here is that we're gonna turn these back into images. So I told you it was gonna be about hearing more, but we really wanna go back and use our same techniques that I've been talking a lot about, about how we can use machine learning to understand, understand images. And so we take this waveform, we chop it up into lots of little pieces. For each of those, we build a spectrogram. This is, this is really just a Fourier transform that we're then representing as, as, an, image, as an image here. We have a whole lot of these for all, the, all, for all the different segments of time, and we put all those together, and now the sound wave, sound wave is an image, and we can use a lot of our standard uh, machine learning techniques on these images. And so that's what we do. So we train a model to go from now this spectrogram image and say, okay, this spectrogram is an FRS score of two, this spectrogram is an FRS score of four. And so, the, and you know, unsurprisingly, you know, this basically works. And let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so one thing, important thing I wanna note here is that we split this by participant. Um, you know, thinking carefully about how you test your model is really important. So here we train on some participants and we test on some others. And by and large, the model is really good. So this is showing you the confusion matrix. This diagonal means the model got it exactly right. And you can see when the model gets it wrong, 
by, by and large, it's not making dramatic mistakes. It's doing most of the errors are kind of one score apart. And what this means um, is that, you know, we, you know, here is an example where the green or the true are the values reported by humans and the blue is what the uh, machine is thinking. And you can start to see, we start to see these sort of trends in behavior even before the, the, this kind of bend label of going from an FRS score of three to two um, goes down. And this is, I think this is actually really interesting because we, uh, you know, we believe we're starting to see finer grain distinctions than these coarse spinnings. And you can see the same sort of thing here for, you know, even before the official label sh shifts, we start to see a change as uh, in, this, in these patients over time. And so I think this is a really interesting example of how we can use these techniques for understanding where patients are and helping us understand the effects um, during drug trials, which is one of the things going on right now. So, so a couple of fi final thoughts. A lot of these modern machine learning methods are really good at these kind of sensory tasks. And I think the kind of thing that where we can use these models to really, you know, allow us to sense, to see new things in the world, is just a really, really promising thing to do. But there is a lot of risk in that. And we really do have to think carefully uh, as data scientists, why we should trust these, how we're gonna evaluate, and, and how are we gonna really build new understanding with those. So, of course, I've talked about uh, work here from a lot of different, a lot of different people. And I wanna thank all the scientists um, whose uh, work I was able to represent today, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, from the audience, if there are any questions, uh, you may raise your hand and we could unmute you or you could simply type your question in the question section. We're also monitoring the chat window as well. So whatever works best for you. I believe the chat window is not open to the participants. I could be wrong. So Patrick, um, we have one question coming in mm -hmm. uh, from the questions window. So in the, the question is, in the last example, why didn't the model overfit and give more discrete predictions? Right, so the question is here, you know, I, I kind of like this idea that we're starting to, that we see some of this ambiguity here. Well, I think, I mean, I, you know, I suspect we could make the model overfit, um, but you know, realize as you look across patients, you know, it might be that some raters of, you know, someone listening to the audio form might have flipped this one a little bit earlier, right? That I'm sure there's a little bit of human variation in this, for example. And so, you know, the model is, I think, you know, going to be reflecting that underlying uncertainty because effectively the label is a little bit random here. Now, we could have, I suspect, again, I suspect we could have made the model overfit um, here on those particular examples, but I mean, I'm also showing results on the, on the, on the test data here. So, um, but this is, you know, I think this is one of the important questions here is that, you know, overfitting is a constant problem to, to be worried but um, uh, it is important that we spend our time and try to understand that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there any applications for X-ray spectra and crystal structures? Um, so, um, let's see, uh, I know that there, ha so we actually spent a little bit of time working with some of the folks from Slack trying on trying to do uh, for x-ray diffraction and trying to do crystal structure solving. And I know there's some other groups doing really good work there. We, you know, played with that idea a little bit, but didn't, uh, you know, didn't sort of, uh, you know, we didn't have, a, have an output that we really, uh, that we were really happy with. Um, as far as um, for not just x-ray diffraction, um, I'm trying to think if I know of other work like this, but it certainly seems like a very natural area to me, but I don't have anything at the top of my head that I can point you to. Okay, um, there is a question asked 
asking why do you have to transfer the wave files to images is it really necessary or do you last in uh, any details during that translation so i mean i i actually i don't think it's necessary and you know there are um people have built a lot of interesting models especially these kinds of um, recurrent uh, models, You've heard, you might have heard of things like LSTMs, et cetera, in order to take um, sequences like this. Um, this was the thing that um, we were able to do uh, very reasonably here. Um, I don't definitely don't think it's easy. It's the only way to do it. So, but well, we don't have to, but it was the thing that was effective. All right. Wonderful. I think we have addressed um, all of the questions as of now, but uh, if you have any audience member have any questions to or follow up, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, gds at aps.org. Um, and then let's uh, move on to the next presenter. Thank you, everybody. Um,